So hello everyone, welcome back to the lockdown video slash podcast. Um, hope you've been well. Today I'm really glad to be joined by Ali Gay, the head of operations strategy at Monzo Bank. Um, Ali, great to have you. How are you doing this evening? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing great. Uh, it's finally the return of the nice day, so uh, I'm feeling uplifted. Um, <laughs> and yeah, no, I feel great. How about you? Good. No, likewise. Um, I think the sun definitely puts a smile on everyone's face. For for, for those of you watching, um, it's, it's especially if you're not in London, it was it was sunny today in the UK and especially in the south of the UK. So that's that's what me and Ali are referring to when we're talking about the, the good weather. Okay. If it's raining where you are, uh, we're, we're sorry. Going, sorry. <laughs> um, so, Ali, great to have you. Um, as I said, uh, really, really keen to just kind of talk to you about your career um had some really interesting and fantastic roles in your career thus far you know clearly obviously your career hasn't finished so no doubt you'll be getting on to bigger better things going forward but thus far particularly interesting so um so yeah we'll jump straight in so Ali you went to um different universities like am I right in am I right in saying that you actually did a kind of undergraduate uh, at more than one institution or was it just mainly at Florida Atlantic University. No, you're correct. So I, I'm French. Uh, well, half French, half Senegalese, and I studied high school, the equivalent in France, and then did my first undergrad degree in France. And it, the system there's a bit different. The way you guys have like bachelor, masters, uh, the durations and everything is a bit different. So I did a first undergrad in France, and then I was actually offered a scholarship to play football in in Florida and get my studies um, paid for at the same time, which is a hard proposition to refuse. Uh, and so I did part of my undergrad there before coming back to France and, and doing a master's. Um, so yeah, I, I've been moving between between unis, but the end result is um, is the same, I guess. Okay, makes sense. Uh, was some was football something that you wanted to pursue or, or kind of fell into it? Uh, I played for a long time and I was I was decent. Uh, never good enough or even close to be pro or anything, anything like that, but it actually opened doors for me. Uh, so I was I could play at a level that was good enough to get a scholarship. Um, and so that really, really uh, helped me actually, you know, study and, and and that was a great opportunity to actually use sport for education uh usually it's the other way around um so no it, it's not something that uh, i was amazing at far from there uh but it it, it served the purpose i'd say so yeah no interesting and, uh, and i think obviously there'll be a lot, lot of people watching that are interested but why i'm interested but why, and we know how tough um, and how ruthless it can be so so yeah you know completely Definitely. understand that so after um after leaving university, I was evidently you obviously talked about you know going back to France and, and finishing your education there. Um, when you were going through your educational experience, because obviously you know you, as we we see here, you know business management management, so there's a lot of business focus in that kind of educational experience. Did you know back then that business was really something you're interested in? That you always knew that you wanted to go into business and that and that be your career as opposed to potentially another another career so initially i wanted to do medicine um that that was kind of my thing coming out of school uh, and then i started thinking is that something that i see myself doing as a lifestyle because i think when you're a doctor or any of these medical profession uh it's it's more than a job right it's it's a lifestyle mm. and i realized it was it wasn't for me if i was honest with myself um the next thing uh, that, that was attracted to was was business um it was quite broad my dad is a, is a salesman by trade and uh, you know has his own business and that's kind of where my interest stemmed from uh, i just had no idea what i wanted to do within a business um and so i went into business as a quite generic uh, discipline and then was hoping that along the way i'd find something that i would like whether it would be hr or um marketing or accounting i wasn't too uh, sure about which discipline but i knew that i wanted to be in business and i also think that to be honest with you studying business is broad enough in most cases to to keep the doors open for you um should you 
want to do something a bit different. And so it was also a strategic move on my on my part, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, and really interesting. So, so are you kind of saying that actually, if you were to give any any young individuals watching this that are making decisions about what to do potentially at university, business mm -hmm. actually open open doors for you, and you you'd recommend it. So that's what I found fascinating when I moved to the UK. I ended up uh, having jobs and working with people in the in a business or operation field that studied anything but that. And, and I found it very specific to the UK where you guys seem to, I say you guys, because uh, that's the target audience here, I'm guessing, but uh, you seem to have that open-mindedness to you know, go for other opportunities that are not necessarily part of your curriculum. In France, it's very much different. Um, I think whatever you study is kind of what you, <laughs> you're gonna go to. Um, and so for that reason, when I was in France in that particular environment, I thought, studying business was the smartest thing to do would i have been in the uk and understand you know you can study french or you know uh, art or literature and still keep the doors open maybe i would have seen things differently but um yeah that was my experience at least i mean it makes sense and yeah and uh, definitely i think from a uk perspective you know I, I can i can agree i know a lot of people that didn't specifically study business but ended up ended up in that field so it's great it makes sense. That's how it should be, to be honest. I, yeah. I don't think you're mature enough at 18, 19 to, to really decide this is what I want to yeah. do. So uh, it, this is the way it should be. For sure. mm -hmm. That makes sense. So after Ali, after university, um, clearly, obviously, you had various roles. And naturally, I, I guess, um, from your perspective back then, you were you know keen to do business you alluded to and keen to kind of as you say like find your feet and understand potentially what your skill set was or what you're interested in etc yep. did you know back then we'll obviously come to some of the more senior roles that you had but the early part of your career did you know that you had more of an interest in in the startup space in the corporate space did you did you start because obviously as you as your kind of linkedin indicates you had various roles from kind of digital content manager perspective to business developer, customer service. So you obviously were spreading your wings. So back then, did you know the direction of travel or you were just kind of seeing what's, what's stuck type thing? Yeah, that's a good question. I know. So I did internship the way, again, I'm coming back to that French university system. You have to do an internship at the end of every single year. And so, and usually those internships are offered in, you know, medium to big companies. And so, I was kind of aware of how it worked in those companies that were well established. I was not fully familiar with the startup space. So going into my first jobs, no, I had I had an experience with big groups or medium size, but I had no experience with startups. In my first job, uh, proper job coming out of uni, which was, which was in London, uh, was for a, a French startup. And that was my first exp experience with it. And it very much shaped the way um, I, I saw startups and, and understand the profile you need to have to, to thrive in them. Mm. Uh, and so that, and then, you know, I'm, I did a few other startups. I've, I've done Serie A, Serie B stage, I've done unicorns, I've done smaller startups trying to get seed funding. Uh, and so I'm still learning, to be honest, uh, about startups and, and the different challenges they pose. Uh, but no, to answer your question, I, I wasn't really sure. Okay, no, that make, makes complete sense. So. As you mentioned there, I moved to London. Was mm -hmm. there a particular reason that you moved to London? Because, you know, obviously there's a conversation that happens quite broadly around London being the kind of startup capital, potentially European yeah. startup capital. Was that the reason or did it go broader than that? So the reason was I wanted to leave France. I wanted to work in English because I'd, you know, spend that time in the US, mm. understood this is, you know, I want to live abroad. Mm. where I wasn't really sure. Mm. London was the obvious choice, to be honest with you, um, when it comes to an English-speaking country, not too far from home. Mm. Uh, and also, to be quite frank, I went through a scheme in France where uh, the French government sponsored companies and helped them pay for young graduates going abroad. And so I applied for a job in that company in particular. That sponsorship was actually uh, for a role in London. It would have been in Copenhagen or Germany. I probably would have gone anyway, but... Uh, it turned out it, it was London, and I'm I'm glad it, it was. To be honest, mm, mm, fantastic. So, Ali, one of your first 
you know, I call high profile, but potentially, potentially interesting roles for, for the viewers, for the viewers watching was for Uber. You had a brief stint at, at Uber. Talk to me about. So I actually, I started Google, and so that's what the resume is a bit. It's been like. Oh right, okay. In a process. So I started we're at a we at a temp at Google. That's how I first got into that space of the mapping space. Fine, um, fine, okay, which makes sense. So, so okay, so. About your about your experience, then I know appreciate it was a brief stint, yeah, but, but good experience at Uber. Interesting was a stepping stone or, or the Uber know? bit. Yeah, the Uber bit. Yeah, so it was very interesting. It was a specific program, so it's it wasn't your ride hailing, even Uber Eats program at the time. It was actually a new program which was around the mapping space, so um, equipping vehicles with cameras and capturing data imagery. Uh, think about Street View before Uber. And that was a program they were setting up back then. Mm. Uh, and that's why I'm, I went there because I had that skill set from Google. Mm. Um, and it was quite, because it was a special project, uh, I was in the Uber offices. I was moving around quite a lot around the UK, working that program that no one really knew about. It was very, uh, you know, hands-on um, mm. in terms of hiring, training, uh, managing the, the programs. And so, I felt pretty remote from the actual Uber experience, like the in-office, uh, very data-driven experience. For me, it was a lot more hands-on and quite a single experience at Uber. Uh, but the people I was exposed to were incredibly smart. I think Uber has that reputation. Yeah. Um, and the program only was closed after a while. It was shut down because it's an expensive thing to run, mapping program. It's very log logistic heavy. And so um, I went back to Google, but that's another story. Uh, but no, the, the Uber experience was great, very specific, and I would not speak uh, on behalf of most people having worked at Uber, um, but I had a great time. It was just a very niche uh, program. Sure, sure. But, but, but interesting, nevertheless. So, okay, so we'll, we'll obviously go on to your, your time at Google, obviously particularly interesting, spent, you know, four and a half years. -ish. On and off, yeah. So it's it was contract, so it was like, doing up to two years usually you have a buffer where before you come back so all in all it was spreading over about three four years yeah mm, okay and was it towards the latter part of your time that that was when you you were stepped into the kind of operational lead role for EMEA or was that was that the whole period or, or what happened there yeah it was the whole period so the title was ops lead EMEA um you weren't leading the whole of the EMEA you were leading a few countries it was you had several ops lead um and and so i jumped straight into this and and i had no massive prior operational experience uh, the operations i did before were very bd sales driven uh, which is what i studied mostly and then i moved to something a lot more operational with no sales really it was all internal facing uh, so completely different and i just jumped into it because someone at google thought that i, I could and it was a big it was a big bet, I guess, because I didn't necessarily have the, the resume, uh, but uh, I ended up loving it. And it was a life changing experience because I realized I'm not a salesman. I'm not that good at that. Uh, I'm a lot more interested in, in the operations, being the guy trying to make things happen. And, and um, so, yeah, I was just launched into it. Uh, yeah. No, no, great. And, and, Naturally, there'll, there'll be people watching this that, that kind of look at working for an organization like Google and, you know, really that's kind of their aim or yeah. potentially what, what they want to do in their career. What would your advice be to people watching the, you know, set their sights at working like at kind of an organization like Google? Is there things that you think make a Google employee or, you know, do you think that it's not as black and white? What is that? Yeah, so bear in mind, again, there's two different experiences at Google. You are either a full-time employee slash Googler or you are part of the temporary workforce. Bear in mind, last time I checked, more than half of the working force uh, was actually not permanent. And so there's just two avenues to work there. And I think you leave very, two very different experiences depending on that. It, is, it also is changing constantly, right? I think you can read about it and there's more and more changes around, you know, the differences between these two types of uh, pools. Uh, that being said, back then I had the full experience, um, you know, and it was fantastic. I think um, I got lucky to get there. I actually got there through another job position I'd applied for, didn't get it. And then I said, hey, why don't you apply for this? 
uh, I was incredibly lucky. Um, and, you know, the takeaways were, this seemed like a huge step and it, it was a big step, but you, you know, most people who come out of school uh, have a go at it, have a chance at it. I think you, if you made it that this far, you, 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 you know, you can have the skills to, to perform. I think that the single things about Google are very, um, very high profile companies is actually the resilience of people there and, and the emotional intelligence, which we can touch on later. But in terms of accessing those roles, it takes luck, uh, it might take network, um, but it is not unfeasible. I think, um, you, you know, you need a bit of luck, but it's doable. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so after Google, you transition into more of a, I say traditional startup, but nevertheless birds and, and, and for people, people watching obviously bird is is more of a scale up i think we can can say now yep. as opposed to traditional startup so obviously you left google went to work for bird had various roles there again you know interesting that that you so you your emir manager and general manager roles i suppose were distinctly quite different so i suppose one was a, was about a country specific role and another one was more regional focused or, or you know so yeah it's it's i think that's the beauty of linkedin like you you know it only also mine is not super developed so i actually joined a company that's called scoot network scoot network was the the pioneer the first company to ever do shared micromobility electric micromobility mm -hmm. in the world so they were in san francisco doing electric mopeds shared uh, since 2012 you could just go there, see a vehicle, you know, open your app, rent it, pay as you go. Uh, and that's how, that's the company I joined. So Scoot was trying to develop in, in EMEA. So I joined as expansion manager. So trying to bring that program to different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and Scoot was at the time very much a, you know, front competitor to Bird or the Lime or all those names. Mm -hmm. um, I'll bet it had been, you know, on for, a bit longer and so i joined this company and then i ended up being the general manager for the u.s market um, because the company wanted me to and the company the company's finances were in a certain state and they needed help um with, with san francisco in particular and so i went there a completely new challenge um they hired me out of barcelona i went to san francisco and i became the, the gm and the idea was to kind of bridge the gap uh, until you know a solution was found to scoots financial problems and it ended up being Bird. Bird decided, hey, we're going to acquire you, especially because Scoot had won the right. permit for Scooters in San Francisco. Yeah, amazing. And and was your time in San Francisco good? You know, obviously different like, different culture, working arrangement to London. Was Did you find it difficult to transition into that kind of market? So the culture, not really. I've, I've been working with American companies for quite a while. Uh, and so I was quite accustomed to working with, uh, with Americans. Um, San Francisco city is on paper great, but it is, if you've ever been, it, it's also the disparity between uh, wealth and, and not wealth is, is very, uh, I wouldn't say shocking, but it, it's quite, um, Mm. hard to, to to witness and so living there was was a really great experience and i got to discover a new city quite well but it's just it, it is uh this city uh, has its own problems i'd say um but it was a fantastic experience especially because san francisco was at the time the market that everybody wanted to be in in terms of micro mobility and and scoot having won that permit uh, i had the chance to to help um you know manage one of the very few programs that were allowed to or the only two programs really at the time. Mm. So great experience uh, in that sense. And, and and actually talking about the kind of globalization element to your career, you also spent some time in Amsterdam, I believe. With, yeah. With Bird. So so I suppose the same question, you know, evidently obviously Amsterdam is nothing like San Francisco. So right. from a cultural perspective, again, difficult transition or, or pretty smooth there? So after I was in San Francisco, Bird, um, Hired me, hired me out of Amsterdam. And so completely different experience. I knew Amsterdam pretty well from previous roles uh, where I was taken to Amsterdam and the Netherlands quite a lot. A uh, completely different city, a uh, completely different culture, especially as before San Francisco, I was in Barcelona. So I did like three countries that were 
very different, but also very progressive. Like each of these cities is very progressive and and um, very modern in the way they approach like you know different things. Uh, so I wasn't completely out of my elements, but um, each experience was absolutely amazing. Uh, the common denominator was also the language. Like in Barcelona, I never really had to learn Spanish, and I feel awful about it. Uh, San Francisco, obviously English, and then Amsterdam you don't even need to speak a word of Dutch really. So um, I was lucky enough that I could work in those markets and actually live there. But Amsterdam is great. I To work in and I think you're seeing the trends. A lot of uh, companies are going there for financial reasons because the share situation is, is specific there. Um, but it's a fantastic market to be in. Plus, as an expat, you pay a specific tax rate. Uh, people don't like to talk about it, but it's very true. Barcelona is the same. Uh, these markets are trying to attract expats and you find a huge number of Brits, for example, in Amsterdam mm -hmm. for that reason in particular. Um, it's very advantageous for companies, for employees. Mm -hmm. um, the quality of life is great. It is rather expensive, but it's not too different from London. So, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, it's a long-winded answer, but Amsterdam no, no, is great. No, but, but thanks for sharing that. There will be people watching that will be particularly interested about potentially the advantages Do it. in yeah. other markets. Just, just, just to kind of close on that, on that chapter, Ali, what would your advice be? Because obviously there are challenges, you know, a lot of young people, a lot of young working professionals that, that, that follow this and follow my channel want to work abroad for obvious reasons. But what would your advice be to making sure that if they do want to work in new markets or, or, or work in other countries, you know, should they prep? What, what should the process be? Is there any advice that you would give them? Because clearly, you know, you worked in the States and the UK and France and Spain and the Netherlands, et cetera. So you're pretty, pretty well versed in this area. Sure. Um, so it, it's, it's intense, right? Like there's only so much you can choose. So my advice is do this smart. Mm -hmm. If you try to go to another country without a job, without any, without the language uh, that's required, you, you're probably going to buy more than you can chew. Mm -hmm. um, and so in my case, I did it when I had jobs actually secured. Mm -hmm. And then what I had to worry about is how do I find a flat? How do I, you know, the actual administrative bits. Oh. Um, so one of my advice is that's better if you can do that. Mm -hmm. It's not always possible, but it's better if, if you can go and, you know, you only have to focus on one thing. Uh, you can never prep too much. Uh, however, you can overthink it and you can just like make hundreds of researches online and try to secure flat views or whatever. And then when you're there, it's completely, completely different to what you expected. So give yourself a bit of margin to... To be flexible and creative when you get there because it might not go uh according to your spreadsheet that you may have prepped or something like that mm -hmm. um but yeah try try to relieve yourself from some pressure when it comes to to, to jobs and things and then find uh, someone there that potentially can orientate you um i was lucky enough to have people in these markets where i could reach out to and say hey how did you do your national insurance number or this or that and that's very useful mm -hmm. Um, so these are my advices in general. Um, yeah. Mm, so networks can be important. No, 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 really, really interesting. Okay, thanks, Sally. So going more back to your, your career. So after Bird, you joined. So obviously it's, it's now called The Up Company, but I, but I believe previously it was called Charged Up, wasn't it? Yeah. Or, or, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So you joined as director of operations. Was this your first kind of SMT senior senior management role, if, if we can call it that? Would you say in your career thus far? Or well, it's all relative, isn't it? It's, it's, that's the thing about tech titles, to be honest with you. It is. It can mean various different things. I've had roles that were not called director, and I would manage an amount of workers at a skill level that was higher mm -hmm. than than some role of director or whatever. So, so that's the first thing to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. um, that's not, I charged up, I had between two and up to seven, eight people to manage, a bit more, I think. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, some being interns, some being more confirmed grads, uh, some being managers in your manager level. Uh, so, but I wouldn't say it was my first array into senior management because I think my time at school would have probably fit the bill more. Um, mm. At Google, I managed quite a lot of people, but it was a lot of frontline workers. Mm. Uh, but Charger was the first time I had a title of director. But again, bear in mind, the scope was different. The company was about 50 people, 60, I think. Mm. It's a different size of company as well. Mm. It's all relative. I think that's, that's one advice I'll probably give is mm. 
don't get hang, don't yeah, don't get stuck too much on titles because they can mean various different things at various different companies. If I'm honest, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. No, really interesting, and I'm really I'm really happy that you, that you went on to talk about that because I think there will be people watching that that do get quite fixed on, mm -hmm. on titles and the yeah. visibility element that LinkedIn obviously gives them in terms of That's what right. title and how many people. Okay. Um, so you were there for for around, for around a year. Um, was it was it kind of a growth phase for that startup when you joined? How how, how was your time there when when you were at the art company? Yeah, so I joined the company because I wanted to come back to London. I was in Amsterdam, and there was an opportunity to come back. And also, I had a pretty good first call with with the founding team. And so, we initially charged up the charging network for phones, essentially, uh, and was it still is like the main network in Europe, uh, not close to, well, almost in the world, taking China outside because it's a huge market in China. But at huge plans, um, you know, it's they were in thousands of venues in the UK, plans to go into thousands of them in, in Europe. And the actual operating model and the, the business model was very similar in ways to the micromobility scooter companies. And so there was like synergies there, cool. uh, huge plans, interesting stage in terms of funding and then literally the week after i started the country went into lockdown and so because the business was targeting uh what we call the entree industry hospitality venues this was just not exactly a product that was um relevant at that stage sure. so we still worked on it but the company diversified and uh, amazingly came up with a cleaned up product which was and sanitizing station that you have seen probably if you've been in the UK, like the yeah, yeah. company sold thousands. And so completely different business. All of a sudden I had to try adapt and had to, uh, you know, provide my services in different ways, but uh, that was the initial plan. And so this company was in very much in growth mode, great perspective. And then in, you know, uh, creation, creative mode uh, and pivot mode, which was an amazing thing to witness and be a part of. Um, but that, that, that's really how it came to be. Mm, amazing. And and I suppose we get to the kind of, not end of your career, but but in terms of where you are right now. So I hope not. <laughs> no, for sure. <laughs> the kind of end of your current list of, of yeah. roles that I think people oh, yeah. listening will, will be particularly interested to hear about. So um, Monzo, Monzo yeah. came, came calling, which I can understand why, you know, obviously fantastic kind of fintech player in the space. Um, just explain to the viewers, head of operations strategy, some people might not actually be clear as to what, what that remit is. So if you don't mind, just kind of give us a kind of high level of what you do now then. Sure. So I think you're right. Like the title tends to be, be confusing to people. Strategy is very much, uh, it's very much broad, right? Like anything that's related to your operations is strategic. You do strategy every day in everything you do if you're at, any level of seniority really strategy means what's happening now what happened in the past and but mostly what we're going to do in the future where are we trying to go and how we get there and so my is essentially coming within the ops collective at monzo which is very broad ops at monzo has a lot of different disciplines uh, and actually owning the process of setting the OKRs, the objectives, uh, try to identify what teams that we get there and then make, making sure we execute and then always be you know, six months a year, two years ahead of time, uh, trying to see what are Monzo's uh, milestones and, and how do they translate to concrete objectives for the, the operations team. Mm. Um, so it's, it's very cross-functional, very broad. Um, it, it requires high level understanding of the company's goals, but also details, um, understanding details of what's happening at on the front line uh in the middle management senior management levels so a very broad role that i really enjoy um because that's the part of operations i enjoy the most the, the strategy and, and and try to influence um the company at a at, a, at this kind of level is super interesting to me Mm -hmm. and, and and obviously you know there will be people watching including myself that, that use monzo <laughs> um and you know it's obviously been a disruptor in the last couple of years but naturally you, you would have read and heard about the the kind of criticism long term about how relevant can monzo be yeah. you know super long term and can it can it become 
you know, the, you know, a new HSBC Barclays in the future, or can it become, you know, the World Bank type thing? So, from your perspective, where where does Monzo go next? You know, are you going to be focusing more on the, the kind of B two B side, wanting to continue to scale your kind of consumer facing business? So, what what what's next for Monzo? Yeah, I think Monzo is is, is a very transparent company, and they they make those you know whatever feeling they have or whatever goals they have, they're, they're, they're very keen on on communicating them very clearly to employees and, and even externally. I think the company has an amazing amount of opportunities. The growth at Monzo uh, in terms of customer acquisition is, is off the chart. I mean, 5 million customer uh, just hit uh, is, is, is just insane, right? Like if you think about percentage of the, the UK population is incredible, uh, especially if you see the spike in the last couple of years. So I think just from a retail B2C model perspective, the potential is there and it shows in the numbers. Uh, B2B is an amazing, fantastic opportunity. Some fintech companies have gone fully B2B. Uh, Monzo is creating a comprehensive solution. Uh, make money work for everyone is what the company is trying to achieve. Um, so whether you're you know, SMB business or a, you know, just a random normal person trying to access and control and manage their finances, uh, the company is, is, is going to try to, to cater to you. Um, so I think, you know, Monzo is, is very clear that it's trying to really help as many people as possible and has a very clear strategy for each of these different verticals uh, as well. Mm, fascinating. So, so no, I suppose not specific to, to you, but one thing that I, I was keen to talk to you about, Ali, is, is clearly the kind of stress element to your career because naturally you've had... A lot of for a lot of senior roles continue to, to grow in your career no doubt um how have you managed stress and i think it particularly relevant now that you're a monzo having obviously the the, the ceo and founder um step away from from the ceo role yeah. wanting to take some time away obviously a lot of reports around um the intensity and stress of of, of, of that role how have you managed stress and what would be your advice to people wanting to you know, pursue a career and rise up the ranks, but but manage stress whilst Yeah. Doing. Uh oh, I hope that's not gonna sound like a blanket in answer, but find you I think you need to know if that works for you right from the start. Um I have friends who are incredibly skilled and have, have a good role. Um, you know, uh, for example, one is, is a finance manager, a wealth management guy, and is so good that he's given the opportunity to, to rise up and being promoted. And he's, he's decided that he didn't want to. He's happy where he is. Um, he find the balance between you know the money he's getting and the responsibilities and the stress level he's, he has to cope with. He finds the balance right for him. And I think that's the first thing. Um, don't force it on you. I think he, we all have our own profile and uh, all have different level of comfort uh, when it comes to me i think sports helped me quite a lot to be honest with you in terms of uh, coping with stress levels um also i like i didn't like to do this before but i quite like now looking back because mm. putting things into perspective is critical you get carried away a lot like it's especially our generation the tech industry it's relentless you you get to a new level and you set of responsibilities and you feel like there's always something more, right? Because I guess there is, but sometimes it's good to look back and say, look, I mean, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty cool already, you know, to be part of this, this company and this part of this uh, adventure. And so for me, it's sometimes looking back and say, Hey, like, you know, yes, it can be stressful, but all things considered, you know, it's pretty cool that you're here. You're really lucky to be able to be part of these stories from these unicorns or big tech companies. So it's, it's putting things into perspective and also really on people. I think you find a great deal of relief um, leaning on people you work with. I think we everybody goes through the same experience. No one is immune to um, stress levels. We all have different degrees of comfort with it, but no one's immune. And so if you really talk to your colleagues or find someone confident, even outside your own workplace, you'll find that everybody's dealing with it and, and being able to relate with people and say, I'm not the only one that find it stressful um, will help you a great deal. So this is how I personally cope with it. Mm. Uh, and also work-life balance. Mm. Um, that will that would be everything, um, you know, do some activity, make some time for yourself and your hobbies um, 
it is very important. And I have a daughter. You may hear the music at the background. I have a baby girl, so that also helped me. Now it's like I have, uh, you know, with my wife, we have something great to 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 look forward to after the work day. So, sure, know, sure. Yeah. Which makes which makes complete sense. But but just kind of the final point on on, the, on this is. You know, naturally, you know, young people get told quite often that to do well in their career, they have to work, you know, a lot of hours, attention to detail, hard work, et cetera. Evidently, you're a good example of someone that's done very well in your career over the last decade and, and, and no doubt will continue to do well. So do you potentially have different advice to potentially what the, what the mainstream media and educational system is, especially in the UK, which is one of the things I, I just alluded to then? Yeah, I'm very hopeful. I'm very hopeful. I see the conversation, well, you know, Mondo CEO, which unfortunately I had not had the chance to meet because I joined literally as he left. Mm -hmm. uh, I joined Mondo recently. Um, but I think that kind of conversation that it is mainstream that people feel comfortable talking about is great. And I think that whole narrative around working hard, you have to work hard for sure because, you know, um, you, you won't, again, you, you know, you may have different objectives in life. Uh, you know, going up the ladder, whatever that means, it might be good for you. It might not be good for someone else, right? Like um, success is very, is, is a scale. Um, that being said, if, if you want to, you know, go up, I guess, in terms of seniority in the tech industry, you need to work hard. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, I think that the conversation is shifting and people understand that. I think that perception that you need to do 60, 70 hours a week mm -hmm. to be considered a hard worker uh, is, is kind of like, uh, hopefully going to be behind us pretty soon. I think a lot of the managers I, I've met over the, the past few years, I've also uh, been really good at saying it's about working smart more than working hard. Uh, no one can be productive for 60 hours a week. <laughs> uh, there's no way. So I think it's about, I think I'm hopeful that the conversation is changing. I also think one advice is be yourself. I think yeah, there's a lot of pressure when you join a company uh, that you want to be the one that you don't want to be the first one to leave. You don't want to be the last one to come online in the morning. Um, the reality is I have not met a manager yet that judge an employee for that. I don't think anyone cares. As a manager, I don't care to be honest. Mm -hmm. What I care about is you uh, taking ownership of your goals and, and delivering. And so um, I, I, you know, I joined companies and I was like, well, this time of the day, I'm going to the gym, you know, between one and 2 p.m. at Google, I was going to the gym and that was my time. And, uh, you know, just just find your flow, uh, understand that you need to take care of yourself and companies will understand, uh, especially in the tech space. I can't speak to other industries. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's, I think we're in a good place as a, yeah, at least in the tech industry um, when it comes to, to work-life balance and, and making it work for everyone. Everyone works very differently. Some people work better in the morning. Some people work better at night. I think more and more we're going to see that shift mm. uh, where companies are more flexible. Mm. No, really interesting. A lot, a lot of good advice there. So, Alice, we get to the kind of end, end of our conversation. You know, evidently you've had, you know, as, as I alluded to, a really good career in the kind of ops space. And I would definitely define you as a kind of operator. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> what you know obviously naturally you know there are lots of individuals that give advice about what makes a great salesperson what makes a great you know developer etc what makes a good operator from your perspective in 2021 would you say yeah i i used to and i was wrong when i told people that i used to tell people oh being good at ops is, is just being a decent human being like I, I made it sound like there was no skills that required to be good at ops <laughs> it's completely wrong with experience uh, you need to be self-organized. Um, you need to be great at communicating because uh, it's such a you know multifaceted role, so cross-functional that you need to be good, clear, uh, concise, uh, while you know, giving enough information. So in terms of comms, you really need to be on it, whether it's written, orally. You need to be able to um, tailor to different kind of stakeholders. You, you might speak to senior management. You might speak to frontline workers. Uh, as an, an operation person, you need to be able to talk to different, you know, kind of employees in different ways. Uh, so in, in emotional intelligence in general, which I think is the biggest trait for any young grad uh, coming up, uh, it's about thinking, you know, don't get too hot, don't get too cold, um, don't get carried away. Think about uh, the, the, the benefits of, you know, trying to give it some perspective and 
and not let your emotions get in the way. I think as an operations person is very critical because uh, operations has metric associated, you know, productivity, uh, delivery of vehicles, uh, whatever that is, like whatever you do in terms of ops, uh, customer support, you always have metrics associated. And, and I think it's a very data oriented role, right? So that's also a skill set you need to have. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, well, Ali, thank you very much. Appreciate it. there's a lot, a lot that yeah, we pleasure. can go deep in there. Um, before you go, what I always ask my guests, and I'm sure you would have heard this, but but uh, I am putting on the spot a little bit here. I always sure. ask my guests, if you were dropped on an island and you had to bring th three things, they can be human beings or physical items, what, what would they be and, and why? Oh, uh, well... I sound like a right idiot if I didn't say my my baby girl. You say no, I like, say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you want, I'll take my wife as well, of course. <laughs> uh, too. Uh, but family apart, which I would definitely take. Sure. Um, I, I'm not going to sound very fancy, but I'm I'm going to take my tablets um, because literally I do I can do the reading on it. I can do anything. Uh, but then if there's no internet, then I won't take it. Uh, I'll take some sports equipment. Uh, gym mat or whatever that is something that allows me to do some exercise cool. uh, and then what would be a third thing uh, probably a piece of paper and a pen because whether I'm in meeting or I like to write things down I don't necessarily going to do anything with the notes but writing helps me kind of like I don't know in my mind organize thoughts uh, and so I guess I'm going to have a lot of thoughts if I'm stuck on an island so I'll take that as well yeah nice Okay, amazing. Well, there you are three things. And of course, you can take your, your wife and your, your baby. And uh, yeah, Ali, yeah, yeah, thank you very much for joining me. I appreciate it. No pleasure. Uh, yeah, thank you for your time. And for anyone who listen, yeah, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn and uh, very, um, very uh, available. Anyone want advice um, or any kind of uh, tip uh, support, um, um, you can always reach me. So feel free to give my, my LinkedIn as well. Cool. And, I, and I'll make sure I share that. Thank you very much, Ali. Appreciate it. My pleasure.